The third day. Savant Blue. Don't be so edgy. Relax, okay? The third morning of our life on Wet Crow's Feather Island was just greeting us. I woke in a daze, trying to distinguish between the dreams I had just had and the reality yet to come. The high rectangular window admitted just a bit of light, so the room still remained dim. Since the room had no lights, I would just have to wait until it got brighter. The sun had only just risen, and it was maybe around 6am, judging from my internal clock. I suspect that this way of determining the time has no more than a 15 minute margin of error, but even supposing that I was an hour off, it's not like that would be a problem. Getting up? I mumbled, and slowly rose from my bed. The room was mostly empty, its only furnishings a chair and a futon. Aside from that, it was completely bare. Its high ceilings gave it an even more spacious feel, and that hollow, dead atmosphere that invokes vividly images of solitary confinement or something. I couldn't help but feel a little bit like an inmate on death row. It was the second time in life that I had woken up with that feeling. But while this was in fact not solitary in confinement, neither was it originally a bedroom. It was formerly a storage space. When I asked her carrier to show me the smallest room in the mansion, this is where she brought me. The smallest room. Even so, it was infinitely bigger than my room at the lodging house. Boy, was that depressing. Nah, it's way beyond depressing, I said to myself. Now then, I switched my cognitive channel from death row inmate mode to routine mode. Wondering what time it was, I glanced at my wristwatch, but the LCD stream displayed nothing. Maybe the batteries had died while I was sleeping. But wait, I'd just changed them a little while ago. There had to be some other problem. Well, I could always ask Kunigisa to fix it. Clearing my sleep-fogged mind, I did a couple of simple stretches and then left the room. It eventually led to the spiral case, which is where I bumped into Reisan and Akarisan. Oh, good morning. You two are up early. It was only common courtesy to greet them, but they simply passed by with no more acknowledgement than a silent head bow. To be fair, they were probably working, and I wasn't exactly a guest per se, so I just had to live with their lukewarm response. If I expected anything more out of them, I'd have to throw my arms out wide and cry out, How are you feeling, freaky people? But frankly, I just don't have the energy. Handa Reisan and Shiga Akarisan were maids employed by the mansion. Reisan was the head maid, Akara her subordinate, and there were two other maids at the mansion of the same rank as Akarasan. A total of four maids. Considering who owned the mansion and the size of the mansion, it seemed as if the staff of four maids would be too small. But these women carried out their duties with swiftness and skill of true specialists. The mistress of the mansion and the person these maids served was Akagami Iria. She was the proprietress of the island, as well as the mansion. And furthermore, she was the one who invited me and Kunagisa here. But wait, was I actually invited? I asked myself. Now just how old was Akara-san? You could tell just by looking at Reisan that she was probably in her late 20s. It's not easy for kids like me to tell exactly how old a woman that age is, but that's definitely the impression I got from her. Akara-san was the real challenge. I didn't think she was younger than me, but still, she looked ridiculously young. She was one of those women you see downtown who you get away with paying half price for everything when they're actually adults. As I went up the spiral staircase and headed down the second floor hall, my mind tilled with nonsense. Maybe she has a thing for young guys. Yeah, just babbling. I was headed for Kunagisa's room. Two days ago when we arrived at the island, a room had of course been prepared for Kunagisa, but not for me. This was to be expected. Even I had had no idea that I would be visiting this weird little island until that very morning when Kunigisa called me. Akarasan prepared a room for me last minute, but I'd politely refused it. Why? The reason hit me as soon as I opened the door. I knocked once, then went ahead and opened it. The interior was vast. Pure white carpet and pure white wallpaper complemented the pure white furniture. Even I knew the white reflects light. Kunigisa was crazy about the colour white so somebody had decorated the room that way deliberately. In the centre of the room was a luxurious sofa and a wooden table. A chandelier hung from a strangely high ceiling. The bed was like something straight out of a movie set in medieval times. He even had a canopy. Yeah, I'd never get any sleep here. And so, I had a carousel show me the storage room on the first floor. Meanwhile, Kunigisa, lacking my more delicate sensibilities, lay there drowsily on a pure white sheet. Looking at the enormous antique mechanical clock on her wall, also 
ever so thoughtfully selected in white, I saw that it was, in fact, six o'clock, just as I'd guessed. Pondering what to do now, I sat on the side of a bed, enjoying the feeling of the thick, fluffy carpet beneath my feet. Kunigisa rolled over, her eyes opened just slightly. Hmm. Oh, Ichan. Somehow she had sensed it was me, but at any rate, she seemed to be awake. She pushed her must eye Hawaiian blue hair away from her face and regarded me with sleepy eyes. Oh, uh, Ichan, um, you came to wake me up, didn't you? Thank you. Actually, I came here to tuck you in, but what's this? Tomo sleeping at night time? That's pretty rare. Or did you just go to bed? If that was the case, I'd have to apologise. Uh-uh. She shook her head. I think I slept for three hours, because, you know, yesterday, well, some stuff happened. Ichan, give me five more seconds. Good morning! Ah, it's a bright, brisk morning, isn't it? She sat up, her petite little body popping up. Flashing me an ear-to-ear -ear grin, she struck a dynamic pose. I, uh, it's not bright out at all. I don't like this. I like the sun to be way up high in the sky when I wake up in the morning. You're talking about the afternoon. Eh, either way, that was some good sleep. Ignoring me. She kept on talking. I'm pretty sure I got to bed at 3am. Some really bad stuff happened yesterday and I was just huffed off to bed. You know, because sleep is the best thing when you're feeling really terrible. It's like sleep is the one and only gift of salvation God gave mankind. Now, Ichan? Yeah, Tomo? Stay still for a sec. Without even giving me time to be confused, she hugged me. Or to put it more accurately, she draped herself on me, burdening me with the entirety of her body weight. She rested her tiny head on my right shoulder, with our bodies stuck together, her slender arms wrapped around my neck. Squeeze. Not that she was heavy. Uh, Kunigisa? Recharging. Evidently, she was recharging. Thus, no moving allowed. I gave up on the idea of resistance and supported her wet. But hey, what was I? An electrical outlet or something? Looking at Kunigisa, I noticed that she had slept with her coat on. As far as I knew, she wore it all the time. Indoors and outdoors, summer and winter. A jet black men's coat on a girl of Kunigisa's tiny stature. The large size coat easily touched the floor but she seemed to be madly in love with it anyway. I had told her millions of times to at least take it off when she's sleeping, but to no avail. One thing was for sure, Kunigisa Tomo did things her own way. In that sense, she was kind of like me. Okay, thanks, she said, and finally let go of me. Battery full. Now, let's go face another day. With a grunt, she rose from the bed, blue hair bouncing. She walked over to the computers by the window opposite her bed. There were the three computers that she brought from her home in Shirazaki. All three were tower models. The two on the left and right were the typical size. The one in the middle was exceptionally large. They were all white, of course. I just didn't get why she was so into a colour that was so easy to get dirty. The three computers were on a U-shaped rack with a cushy rolling chair in the centre. Kunigisa plopped down in her chair and leaned back. That way, she could simultaneously control all three computers. But no matter how you counted it up, she still only had two hands. Why she would ever think to use three keyboards at the same time was beyond me. I looked over her shoulder. The three keyboards were neither ASCII nor JIS, nor Oasis, but instead some weird, mysterious key alignment. But to question the unnaturalness of it would be futile. For the engineering whiz like Konagi Satomo, designing a keyboard from Strat was probably like a walk in the park. Incidentally, Kunigisa didn't use a mouse, because they're a total waste of time, she would say. But to a novice like me, the sight of a mouseless computer was unnerving. Just totally impossible to get used to. Not that this is the worst feeling in the world. E chan Yeah? Tie my hair up. Got it. I went up to her chair. I slipped some hairbands off her arm and tied her hair into two braids. Man, wash your hair already. My fingers are getting oily here. I hate taking baths. Because, you know, your hair gets all wet and stuff. But, of course. Look at this. The blue's getting dark. I can't see my own head. <laughs> if I leave it like this, it'll turn ultramarine. Thank you, Ichan, she said, buying her own lift with a giggle. I just looked back at her with an innocent, confused smile. Uh, no problem, really. Even as we talked, her fingers never stopped moving. 
They move with the accuracy of a machine, at a constant rhythm with every keystroke. It was as if she was unconsciously carrying out some pre-planned assignment in some pre-programmed way. Incomprehensible English characters and numbers streamed along all three monitor displays at an unbelievable pace. Tomo, what are you up to anyway? You just got up. Hmm, well, I don't know if you'd get it even if I told you. Hmm, you really need all three PCs to do it? I said. She gave me a perplexed look. Ichan, this one in the middle isn't a PC, it's a workstation. What's a workstation? It's not a PC? Nope, it's different. Well, I guess PCs and workstations are similar, but they're both intended for individual use. But, it's like, workstations are a way more top of the line. Ah, so a workstation is like a super good PC, I said, openly displaying my ignorance. She groaned. Ichan, a PC is a PC and a workstation is a workstation. They're both GPCs, but think of them as two completely different things. What's a GPC? She looked at me as if I was some kind of caveman. Ichan, you don't know anything, do you? She said with a touch of disbelief. What exactly were you doing in Houston for those five years? Other things. She sighed. Okay, okay, she said, tilting her head. Then she resumed her work as if the switch had been toggled in her brain. Letters and numbers that looked like hocus pocus to me continued to stream by on the displays. I wanted her to tell me a little more about the different classifications or what have you, but I'm not really intellectually curious. Besides, it would be rude to interrupt whatever she's working on. And for an outsider like me to try and follow this nerdy cupcake's explanations seemed as if it would just lead to a headache. So with that, I ended the discussion. I massaged her shoulders for a bit and then decided to borrow the sink, where I washed my face and changed my clothes. Hey Tomo, I'm going for a walk. Without looking up from her work, she gave me a half-heart wave. The other hand kept tapping keys. I shrugged and left the room. I'd be lying if I said I knew that much about the Akagami Foundation. They're not exactly the most well-publicized organization in the world, but since they're mostly operated in the Kanto region, someone like me who was born in Kobe, grew up in Houston, Texas, and lived in Kyoto wouldn't know that much about them. Putting it simply, the Akagami Mansion was home to a storied legend of business barons. That business might have been some kind of trade or system in which money just poured in on its own. I'm not sure what exactly they did, but wherever it was, one thing was for sure. The Akagami Foundation was loaded. Holding property not just in Japan, but all over the world, and the owner of the western-style mansion found in the centre of the island was none other than Akagami Iria. As you might have guessed from her name, Iria was related to the head of Akagami Foundation. His granddaughter, in fact. She was a born and bred pedigree princess of whom no obsequious praise was too obsequious. Over time, she inherited vast amounts of enormous wealth and unbelievable power, and ruled over a great many underlings. But then, the head of the foundation himself had completely cut her off. So maybe this is all really better expressed in the past tense cut off. I don't know what she did to deserve it, but it must have been something big. Supposedly she was permanently removed from the family five years ago, at the age of 16. At that time, the head of the family left her with a small severance package, which was probably still an unimaginable sum for a regular Joe like me. And this island floating around the Sea of Japan. And this island floating around the Sea of Japan. In other words, she had been exiled. Maybe these days that seems old fashioned, but far be it for me to butt into other people's ways of doing things, especially if those people belong to a powerful institution that's practically its own world in of itself. Anyway, Iria had spent the last five years here with her four maids, not one setting foot off the island. Five years ago on this godforsaken island in the middle of nowhere, with no amusements, no nothing. In a sense, it was life in hell, though I would speculate that, in a different sense, it was also like life in heaven. But was Iria lonely or bored? Indeed, you could say that Kunagisa had been invited to the island to stave off Iria's boredom, but it wasn't just Kunagisa. In the same way, it would be no exaggeration to say that Akane-san, Maki-san, Yoyoi-san, and Kanami-san had all been brought here for the same purpose. Well, okay, maybe it's a little bit of an exaggeration. So anyway, forbidden to leave the island, Iria-san said, well, if that's how it is, and proceeded to invite as her guests, the world's most prominent figures. Now, prominent figures sounds a little weird. Let me try putting it another way. 
Iria had decided to invite so-called geniuses to a mansion. It was a simple plan. If I can't go to them, they can come to me. Famous and unknown alike, all those who possessed genuine talent and amazing skill were summoned by Iria-san. One after another after another. And of course, all the expenses, including accommodations, were covered by Iria-san. In fact, visitors to the island were often given money, so it was pretty much always a win-win situation for them. To me, it seemed that Iria was going for that whole ancient Greek salon image, collecting and converting with all these artists and geniuses, and thereby living a fruitful life. To be sure, it wasn't the most typical idea around, but yes, there was something amazing about it. Aside from the mansion and the forest, the island was essentially empty, almost a desert island. Of those world-weary men and women of talent who needed to rest both body and mind, it was a perfect place. And thus, Iria-san's plan had been a tremendous success. Now then, walking around aimlessly on this empty island, basking in the forest, it was by an extremely distant cherry blossom tree that I suddenly ran into Shinya-san. Oh, uh, that is, I mean... Shinya-san said, waving her hand to greet me. You're quite an early bird there, eh? Mr, uh, what was your name again? Sorry, my memory's a little weak, you see. He had a good four inches on me, and his designer clothes were much better than mine. His expression was mild manners, his way of speaking was mild mannered, and so was somehow his clothing and stature. But whether or not Shinya san really was mild mannered, I couldn't say. I don't have the skill to judge someone based on their appearance, and I'm the last person to jump to conclusions after knowing someone for just a couple of days. I don't believe I ever told you, I answered with a shrug. I'm just Kunigisa's Thomas psychic. No need for a psychic to have a name, am I right? That's awfully modest of you. Not that it's any wonder being on an island, but speaking of sidekicks, I suppose I'm in the same boat as you, Shinya-san said, and smirked. Yes, Shinya-san and I were no more than tagalongs. It probably goes without saying at this point, but I wasn't there walking around the island because I was any kind of genius. Kunigi Satoma was the genius here, and I was nothing more than her attendant. If she hadn't said to me, Ichan, it turns out that I'll be going to some island, so come with me, care? Right now, I would have been in my Kyoto four tatami sized room getting ready for school. No question about it. The main character here is Kunigi Satomo. Let's just make that clear. Now then, as for Shinya-san, who is accompanying, well, she was right under the cherry blossom tree. With those thoughtful, thoughtless eyes, she gazed and fluttered the cherry blossom petals. She had blue eyes and a hair of gold. Her dress was pale in colour. Was it out of some French movie? And was accented with dazzling jewellery. Just one of her necklace and bracelets was probably worth more than my liver. Even if I sold off every part of my body, I still couldn't pay for it. Ibuki Kanami, one of the geniuses. Having supposedly suffered problems with her leg from birth, she was confined to a wheelchair, and thus Shinya-san, as her caretaker, had tagged along on the trip. As I'd heard it, until a few days ago, she had been totally blind. Her blue eyes were not a sign of foreign blood. Kanami-san was a painter. Even I, without the slightest knowledge of the field whatsoever, had heard of her. She had earned a reputation as a painter who had possessed no single style. I had never actually seen Kanami-san's painting, but I thought that maybe she was gazing at the cherry blossoms in that way so as to later portray them on the canvas. What is she doing? As you can see, she's watching the cherry blossoms. It won't be long before petals start falling. She has a fondness for that. Moments just before death, if you will. The ephemeral things in life. Most of the trees on the island were just your standard fare, but for some reason, there was one cherry blossom tree. It looked quite old, and the fact that there was only one in the whole island was nothing short of bizarre. Most likely, Iria had transplanted it there. So, they say dead bodies are buried under cherry blossom trees, eh? How dreadful. Ouch. I was trying to make conversation, but instead ended up in one fell swoop. Of course, it was pretty dreadful. Just joking, Shinya-san laughed. Personally, I think it would make more sense if that legend was about a plum tree. But in that case, it wouldn't be a legend, but a myth. <laughs> By the way, boy, have you gotten accustomed to the island yet? This is your third day here, right? Hmm. How long are you planning to stay again? A week. So we have another few days. Hmm. That's too bad, he said with a tinge of mystery. What's too bad? Oh, it's just that I hear Iria-san's favourite will be coming here in a week. But if you're leaving in four days, you'll just have to miss each other, won't you? That's just too bad. Oh, I see. I nodded and thought for a moment. Iria-san's favourite. In other words, the genius of geniuses. A chef, a fortune teller, 
a scholar, an artist, an engineer, what could be next? Well, I haven't heard any specifics myself, but apparently this person is capable of just about anything. Not a specialist, but generalist. Hikari-san tells me that this person is sharp as a tack, and full of knowledge, and has lightning reflexes. Hmm, yet another totally amazing person. Let's assume that it was just some ridiculously over-the-top rumour. The fact that the rumour even existed suggested that this particular genius wasn't just anyone. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't intrigued. Couldn't hurt to meet this person, I guess. What do you say about asking for an extension on your visit? I'm sure iria -san would more than welcome you. Sounds nice and all, but I probably look less than excited. To be honest, this island is a little stifling for a regular kid like me. I mean, I said. Shinya-san guffawed boisterously. Now, now. Now, 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 now. There, lad. Is that how it is? Kanami-san and Akane-san and all of them haven't given you a complex, have they? A complex. Even supposing it wasn't something you could put so bluntly. What I felt was certainly something similar. Shinya-san gave me a firm pat on the shoulder. There's no reason to feel inferior to that lot, right? Let's keep it together, brother. Whether it be Kanami-san... Kanami-san glanced up from a cherry blossom tree. Whether it be Akane-san, Yoyoi-san, or even Kunigisa-chan. If they were to play the two of us in rock, paper, scissors, they would only win one out of three times. I suppose Maki-san would be an exception there, but nevertheless. That's a pretty blunt way of putting it. Not to mention Shinya-san had just referred to his own employer as part of that lot. I'm not saying that they were at each other's throats or anything, but maybe Shinya-san and Konami-san weren't quite the best of friends. Talent isn't such a big deal, in fact. I, for one, am glad I don't have any. Talent isn't worth spit. Why is that? If you've got talent, you've got to exert effort. Being ordinary is a breeze. Having nothing to master is an advantage, if you ask me, Shinya-san said with a cynical shrug. I think we got a little off topic. Anyway, I don't think it would be a terrible thing if you were to extend your stay. If you ask me, and hey, just maybe this generalist will beat us in rock purposes all three times. Well, I'll talk it over with Kunigisa. It would hardly be right for the Tagalon to decide that all on his own. I thought so, he said. You're a lot like me, he said, looking me in the eye. His gaze was deeply disconcerting. He gave me that uncomfortable feeling that you get when you're being watched. Me and you, alike? How do you mean? In what way? Don't sound so happy about it. In particular, you're practically identical holding the idea that you yourself are a part of the world. Seemingly with no intention of explaining himself any further, he broke his gaze and looked back at Kanami-san. Predictably, Kanami-san was still staring at the cherry blossoms with complete concentration. She was surrounded by a sort of transcendence, as if just that one spot was isolated from the rest of the world. She had the air of being unapproachable, even scared. So Kanami-san has been painting even since coming here. Well, it's more like she came to this island to paint. That's really all she does, after all. I suppose you could say she lives to paint. Can you believe it? He spoke with a tinge of frustration. But if you took his words at face value, it sounded like an incredibly enviable existence. A life where you could do what you want to do and what you have to do are directly connected. It was a way of life I could never even hope for. I, who had discovered neither what I wanted nor what I had to do. I noticed that Shinya-san was watching me with a wicked smile, like he had just remembered a bad prank. I recoiled a little. I was getting a bad feeling, like a premonition. And then Shinya-san, with a look on his face as if to say, I've just had a revelation from God, clapped his hands deliberately. That's right. It's just a prime opportunity, so why don't you try modelling? He sat me aside and I stood up at a loss for words, and unable to comprehend his, and faced Kanami-san. Hey, he called. Kanami, this fella says he wants to be a model. Wait, Shinya-san, finally grasping the situation, I spun in front of him. I can't just, I mean, give me a break. Now, now, why are you so embarrassed? That hardly suits your character. I don't think so. Asking Kanami-san to paint me, that was an incredibly intimidating idea. But Shinya-san blew off my protest with a simple, now, now, don't be shy, and waited for the answer from Kanami-san. Kanami-san adjusted the direction of a wheelchair and looked at me. She scanned me up and down from the tip of my head to the tips of my feet, observing me, assessing me, and said, So you want me to paint you? She sounded truly irritated. This was a difficult question to answer. With someone as talented as Kanami-san, the simple act of hesitating would have been rude. I was weak in these situations. A real pushover. A 19-year-old boy who spent his life going with the flow 
has not the power to alter the flow of a tale. Yes, absolutely, if you don't mind, I said. Kanami-san simply looked disinterested. Fine then, come to the Altalir this afternoon, she said, and swiveled her wheelchair back towards the cherry blossoms. She put with heartfelt apathy, but at least she had taken pity on me. Well, that's settled then. Are you free this afternoon? Shinya-san said, strangely joyful. I told him I was free and decided to get going before I got into more trouble. I returned to the mansion and visited Kunigisa's rooms once again. Kunigisa was just as I had left her, sitting in a revolving chair, her three PCs, I mean two PCs and one workstation, in front of her. Right now she was focused on the workstation, and the two PCs had their power switched off. What are you up to, Toma? No reply. I went up to her from behind and tugged both of the braids. Ow! She uttered in a strange voice. Seeming to at last notice my presence without changing her position, she gaped at me in bewilderment. Surely I appeared upside down in her eyes. Yo, Ichan, you're back from your walk? Yeah, well, say, is that a Mac? The monitor on the workstation opposite Kunigisa was playing some kind of Mac OS screen. As far as I heard, Mac OS only worked on Macs. Yeah, it's a Mac OS. You see, there are some applications that only work on Mac OS, so I'm running it on a virtual machine. Virtual machine? Basically, I'm making the workstation think there's a Mac inside it. In other words, I'm tricking the software. Of course, Windows is on here too. Most OS's are installed on the workstation, so it could do anything. Ah, I didn't really get it. This is a dumb question, but how are Mac and Windows different anyway? She gave my truly amateurish question a moment's thought. They're different because different people use them, she answered with an air of precision. Well, yeah, that's true, but, well, forget about that. So OS is like the core software, right? I think that's right. So then, it's like a computer has multiple personalities. It's a strange metaphor, but you could say that. So then, that PC uh, workstation, what's its core core OS? Like, with multiple personalities, you have a main personality, right? Geoside. Never heard of that. Is it like Unix? That's Unix, with a U sound. Come on, you studied abroad. You should know how to pronounce the alphabet like Romanized Japanese. Ichan, it makes you sound so stupid. It's compatible with Unix. It's an original OS developed by the friend of yours truly. A friend? Kunigisa's friend. The only friend of Kunigisa who could have developed the original operating system was someone from that team. From that notorious team. Several years back in the last century, during a time when the Japanese network was still underdeveloped, that group appeared. Oh, no. Appeared isn't the correct expression. They never for an instant let their visage, nor their shadow, nor even their smell grace the public eye. They never announced their name. Whatever name they had ever been known by had been applied by others. Whether you call them a virtual club, cyber terrorists, a crack unit, or a gang that made mountains out of molehills, it didn't matter to them, and they probably wouldn't respond. They were completely peerless, species unknown. I learned many people were there. And just what types of people comprised this team? These things were all shrouded in mystery. What did they do? Everything. They did everything. That was all you could say about it. They did so much of everything, there was nothing that they didn't do. They wreaked havoc, havoc, and more havoc. I wasn't in Japan at the time, so I didn't get to see it firsthand. But they say it was such full-on ludicrous havoc that it was practically refreshing, lending no hint as to their motives or aims. Beginning with pure hacking and cracking, they also had their hands in corporate advising and fixer fraud. It's also quietly speculated that back then, they controlled a number of large corporations. But you couldn't say they existed solely as a nuisance. For better or worse, it was thanks to them that the overall level of network technology improved drastically. You could even say that they forced it. If you looked at it through a fine-tooth comb, Sure, there were losses, but in the big picture, the gains outweighed them tenfold. But of course, the fat cats upstairs saw them a little more than pesky, law-breaking criminals. A hacking, cracking eyesore. Thus, the team went on, despised and pursued. But they were never caught, and exactly what they were doing was never brought to light. Then, sometime last year, suddenly, and without anything particular having happened, they were never heard from again. It was as though they had just been burned out and vanished. Yo, what's wrong, Ichan? You're quiet all of a sudden. Nah, nothing. She flipped her hair with a giggle. Yeah, I guess it's nothing. 
It was in that way that the team met what was, in a sense, an anticlimactic end. Who would believe that a leader of a now defunct team was such a happy-go-lucky girl and still in her teens? Exactly who in their right mind would believe something so nonsensical that it couldn't even be mistaken for a sick joke? But if that wasn't the case, Kunigisa wouldn't have been invited to this genius-ridden island, not as a communication and systems engineering specialist. How could I not have a complex Shinya-san? Huh? Did you say something? Kunigisa glanced up from a moment. Just babbling, I said. So geocide, doesn't that mean earth murder? Yep, of all of the existing OSs, it's probably the most awesome. Geocide is number one. Even the racist is perfect. Sometimes I think you use those big words just to tick me off. What's a racist? It's an acronym for reliability, availability, serviceability, integrity, security. But of course, that's in English, she said a bit eligibly. Because it means stability. Of course, that requires high performance system, but it won't cause errors or anything like that. Man, that Achan really is a genius. <laughs> Achan, huh? Sounds like you two are pretty close. Hmm? Jealous? Hmm? Hmm? She said with a strangely pleased tone and a naughty smirk. It's okay, I like you best of all. Ah, right, appreciate that. I shrugged and tried to change the subject. But if it's such an amazing OS, why not market it? If it was sold like Windows, you'd make a fortune. No can do. You know about increasing returns, right? With an OS this different, we'd never catch up. Business goes beyond skill or talent. Increasing returns, the law of economics that states, the more you have, the more you get, which does nothing for you when you don't have. It had been a while since I studied it, so I didn't remember it very clearly. But to put it simply, once a significantly problematic difference has appeared, it's impossible to bury that difference. Whether it be in regards to skill or money, it seemed to make no difference. Besides, Archan was satisfied by creating Geocide. Archan's a very self-satisfied person. Yeah, he must be very happy. Even if it wasn't the case, I don't think it would be possible to market it. Even though it's just core software, it requires some pretty outrageous specs. Seriously astronomical figures. Even my machine just barely cuts it. Hmm. How many gigs is your hard disk? About 100? 100 tera. Different unit. Terra is the opposite of a Pico, so a thousand times a gig? Nope, 1024 times. Nitpicky chick. Man, I've never seen a hard disk like that. To be specific, it's not a hard disk, it's holographic memory. Unlike hard disks which record data with magnets, this records data onto a surface. It's capable of one tera per second rapid transfer. What you'd find on the market is, well, quite a bit slower. This is the kind of media they're using to development of space technology. She had those kind of connections too. She belonged to an altogether dubious community. Of course, this goes for the machine's capacity as well. But if the motherboard specs aren't customised homebrew as well, you're probably out of luck. Archan just makes things without considering any surrounding circumstances, you see? So they just end up like this. He doesn't try to suit things to other people. Motherboard homebrew? There are people who do that? Like yours truly, for one. She indicated herself with a thumb. That's right. She was an engineer after all. She must have been the culprit for finding their teammates with hardware and software to be their main weapons. If you thought about it, it was fairly disturbing. It was one thing to develop a seemingly unmarketable OS like that, but to take it and build your own motherboard for it was just plain freakish. Mr. Earth Murder aside, haven't you considered selling this stuff? Like that motherboard you're so proud of? I'm the self-satisfied type too. How about you, Ichan? Hmm, I wonder. Regardless of talent or lack thereof, in the end, all people are classified into two groups, those who pursue and those who create. My own case notwithstanding, Kunigisa was overwhelmingly the latter. Besides, as far as money's concerned, I've got plenty and then some. I'm not thinking about making any more right now. Ah, no wonder. That was true. Kunigisa wasn't in a position that demanded that she immediately go into business. It wouldn't be much of an exaggeration to say that she spent money like it was water. A 19-year-old occupying a high-class two-floor condo in Shirasaki, sending money as fast as she could. I didn't know how many people out there had more money than Kunigisa, but surely no one individual spent as much. Between the Akagami Foundation and the Kunigisa household, who held the greater power was beyond my realm of knowledge. But either way, they both possessed enough of a fortune to enjoy the best thing in life and still get changed back. That much was certain. Speaking of which, Kunigisa resembled the master of the island, Iria, in that she too was semi-exiled from her family. Perhaps they were similar people. In the three days that I'd spent on the island, signs indeed pointed to the contrary. But, well, they were both eccentric, that was for sure. 
so much that it would have been impossible for them to blend into any group or members of any organization. Surely that's how it was. In which case, this island, the meaning of this so-called island of wet crow's feathers, could have used to return to a typing. I'm gonna have breakfast, what about you? No thanks, not hungry. It's mating season, Ichan. Go ahead on your own. Eat for me too. Gotcha, I said, and headed for the dining room. Akane-san was in the dining room. I tensed up. She sat alone at the round dining table with her legs crossed in an elegant, somehow un-Japanese purse, having her breakfast. Or no, she had already finished breakfast and was enjoying an after-meal coffee. Oh, good morning. It was the bright and lively voice of Akari-san in the midst of cleaning the dining room. No, wait, it wasn't her. Akari-san never greeted me bright and lively. That wasn't the Hikari-san I knew, which meant, Hi, Hikari-san, I said, determining that it was Hikari-san. Evidently, I was correct, as she then grinned at me and bowed. Chiga Hikari-san and Chiga Hikari-san, they were sisters, twins. To be sure, there was a third sister as well, their silent younger sister, Teruko. Teruko apparently had poor eyesight, and was recognisable by her glasses with their black lenses. Akari-san and Hikari-san, however, were perfectly identical, from the length of their hair to their clothes, to the point that they weren't just similar, they were the same. But unlike Akari-san, Hikari-san was an incredibly kind person. Even though I wasn't a true guest, she treated me the same as everyone else. Breakfast? Wait one moment, please, she said, then spun around and hustled off to the kitchen. She must be so good at spinning because she's small, I thought. With Hikari gone, I was suddenly left alone with Akane-san. After a split-second hesitation, I went ahead and took a seat next to her. I thought to greet her, but she seemed completely immersed in thought, mumbling to herself in a semi-audible voice, not even looking in my direction. It was as though she hadn't noticed me. What in the world was she thinking about? I pricked my ears to listen in. Sente 9-6. Pawn. Kote 8-4. Pawn. Sente. Same pawn. Kote 8 7. Pawn. Sente 8 4. Rook. Kote 2 9. Pawn. Sente 3 2. Silver General. Kote 9 5. Pawn. Sente 4 4. Bishop. Kote 5 9. Gold General. Take. Sente 27. Knight. Meaning unknown. That's what you get from one of the seven fools. Even the things they mutter to themselves are different, I thought. Thoroughly impressed. But listening closely, it sounded like she was reciting a shogi game record. Wow. Blind shogi. And by herself, no less. Is this what she did on the morning? Kote 23. Pawn. Checkmate. Sente forfeits, she said, and glanced over at me. Ah, I was wondering who it was, and here it turned out to be you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Isn't Shogi tough? The pieces move around a lot more than chess. I was playing Kote just now. It was a close victory. Huh? There's a Sente and a Kote and single-player Shogi? Maybe Akane-san was able to divide her mind like a dolphin. Yeah, it seemed likely for someone like her. Are you good at shogi, or chess, whichever? I wouldn't say so, no. Hmm, is that so? Reading other people's minds isn't my forte. Oh no? Hmm, I suppose not. You've got that kind of face, she nodded. I saw you from the window a little earlier. Out for a morning walk, were you? Yeah, a walk in the woods. Ah, a walk in the woods. How nice. Very nice. The fight on side released by the trees creates a back decidual effects and such. What the hell? In Houston, Texas, in America, there's a research facility called the ER3 system. There, brilliant minds around America, nay, around the world, gather, and it is referred to as the ultimate bastion of learning. From economics to history, political science to cultural science, physics and advanced mathematics, biology, electronic and systems engineering, 
anything that could be called a field of study or research. It's also known as a comprehensive research centre. It was a gathering place for those who loved learning and research above all else, a nest for those inhuman humans whose desire for knowledge exceeded even their natural biological desires, an entirely non-profit organisation. They dared not a single knowledge or research finding. They were in a sense a closed and introverted sort of secretive organisation. There were only four basic rules. Have no pride, have no principles, have no attachments, no whining. They were to unbegrudgingly cooperate with one another to the fullest of their ability, to never be unproductive, even if the world should perish, to never quit halfway, come hell or high water. The ultimate destination for those who wanted to research, who wanted to know, who had to know, with means to an end in complete harmony, it was the ER3 system. The people gathered there ranged from highly esteemed college professors to frontline Crete searchers and amateur academics, a truly pride-free assembly of all manner of individuals. Their reputation seemingly so bizarre that the media ridiculed them as a cultish pack of over-educated loonies. But their research had yielded great rewards. The demystification of Delevier nonlinear optics, the overwhelming advancement of volume hologram technology, the establishment of near magical DOP as a sensor sectology were all thanks to the ER3. Not the work of individuals, but rather team efforts, and non profit work at that. They declined all awards over various honours, and thus had not come to draw much attention, but their reputation within the academic world was certainly high. It was a research centre with relatively brief history, not even a century old but it was already globally networked. And within this research centre existed a transcendental group known as the Seven Fools. Seven individuals selected in turn by the selected Seven on the Verge of Answers to the Universe. They were true geniuses among geniuses. One of these seven individuals was Sonoyama Akane-san. She had beautiful black hair, cut ruler precise to lend her an air of intellectualism. She was tall for a woman, with a stylish slender build, there wasn't a part of her that wasn't overflowing with elegant femininity. She was a Japanese woman scholar of the highest order. The ER3 system is relatively unknown in Japan. The fact that the ER3 itself is so exclusive is no doubt part of the reason for this. The main reason is likely that the uncategorizable nature of the center doesn't fit with the Japanese way of doing things. But nevertheless, Akane-san, as a pure and innocent Japanese woman, and in her twenties no less, risen the ranks of the ER3 Seven Fools. It would come to no surprise if one day she was a household name in Japan. Now this all may beg the question, if I'm just a pure and innocent Japanese person too, how come I know so much? But there's no special reason really. It's not that I'm particularly well informed, it's just that ER3 and I have crossed paths a bit. You see, in preparation for the long term, ER3 system implements a study abroad program to educate the youth of the next generation. For five years, beginning with my second year in junior high school, I participated in the program, so naturally I knew Soyano Akane's reputation as one of the Seven Fools, as well as her above the clouds existence. And that's why I was surprised to discover Akane-san here on this island. I'm not at all the kind of type who surrenders unconditionally at the first sniff of authority or talent, but I can't help but be nervous. What exactly do you say to someone of the Seven Fools? I was sitting there, all clammed up, when Akane spoke to me. By the way, that blue haired girl, Kunagisa chan I mean. Uh, yes. She's just lovely. Last night I had to do some maintenance on my PC. She's incredibly skilled, isn't she? We have tech is the ER3 as well, but I've never seen one with such mechanical precision. She made it look like routine work. This may sound rude, but for a moment I wondered if she was really human. I was sure Iria-san would absolutely adore her. Ah, really? I hope she didn't bother you or anything. She let out a little chuckle. You sound like a baby stroller. A baby stroller? Once again, I had suffered an unfounded assessment. You mean a babysitter? Well, they both mean the same thing, yes? A stroller is a kind of carriage. Ah, right. She nodded. For all her evident ability in math and science, it seemed Japanese was not Akane-san's forte. Well, either way, she was no bother at all. Well, duh. Then again, she seemed a bit of the socially awkward type. I don't think she listens when people are talking. And as a result, my PC evolved about two generations. But that's actually the improved Kunigisa. She used to be terrible to talk to, just starting and stopping whenever she felt like it. It was pretty rough for me. Hmm. If you want my opinion, I think there's a certain charm to her unapologeticness. Eh, I'm not sure I agree on that. Have it your way, Akane-san shrugged. 
By the way, I also heard from her that you were in the ER program. Huh? That blabbermouth had let the cat out of the bag. I thought I'd told her to keep quiet. Not that I was fully aware there was no point in trying to keep that girl quiet. You should have told me. We could have had quite a chat. I felt like we wasted two days. I don't suppose you were holding back by any chance. Please, don't get me wrong. I'm not such a big deal. No, it's not that. I guess it was just hard to bring up. And also, even though I was in the program, I quit midway through. The program is 10 years study. I dropped out after my fifth year. From there, I returned to Japan and reunited with Kunigisa. Luckily, I was already qualified as a high school graduate from my second year in the program, so I was able to transfer directly to Kyoto Rokumun University. It's still a big deal. Regardless of what sprain it became for you, that's a strain. Regardless of what strain it became for you, the ER program's entrance exam is a great obstacle to have overcome. You should have a little more pride about your accomplishments. The ER program's, the ER program's entrance exam was unusually difficult. Even in the application guide, it said, There are no perks. This does not guarantee your future. No one will come to rescue you. We offer only an environment in which you may state your intellectual curiosity. Yet still, elite candidates from all around the world gathered to take the test. So it was true. Merely passing the test was something to boast about. But I hadn't completed the program. There's no point if you drop out halfway. End results are everything in this world. Actually, I happen to think that everything in this world is a result. Or are you one of those a genius is a genius is a genius people? She had the slightest bit of sarcasm in her tone. A genius is not a rose. In Japan, you often see people who take pride simply in the effort that they give. Don't you? I endured great hardships regardless of the end results, they say. They say that there's merit in effort alone. I think there's a valid outlook saying, I worked hard. It's a fine conclusion in of itself. What I have a problem with is low lowlifes who spout absurdities like, I could have done that if I wanted, or I couldn't do it because I wasn't trying, or I said I can do it, but it doesn't mean I will. That's all ridiculous. There really are all sorts of people in this world, huh? I didn't try because I couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, you've got this sort of world-weary quality about you. It's probably just modesty. Bingo! The right part of her lip curled into a half-smile and she produced a pack of cigarettes from her pocket. In graceful, fluid motions, she put one in her mouth and lit it. Wow, you smirk. I'm surprised. Are you the type that doesn't like women who smirk? Well, no, not women in particular. Smoking is bad for your health, you know. Health is bad for your smoking, you know, she retorted, slowly exhaling smirk. There's the seven fool's wit, I thought, but she smirked with embarrassment. It's a stupid argument, huh? Don't mind me. It'd be awful if you ended up thinking I was that kind of person, she said. Shall we change the subject? You know, you know, I was actually in Japan all the way through high school. Really? I was a little surprised. But if you thought about it, it was really no mystery. Which high school? Just your average prefectural school. It wasn't particularly well known. I was in the girls karate club back then. I didn't like it at all at the time, but in retrospect, it was really fun. Gee, that takes me back. It's already been more than 10 years. The skirts back then were this long. I didn't have the best grades, but I was good at math and English. That's why I ended up in an overseas university. My family were very against it, but I defied them. After all, don't they say if you love someone, set them ablaze? No. Anyway, if it was like that, so I ended up cutting myself from my family and crossed over to America on my own. It was a hell of a big move for someone like me back then. And thus she ended up in The Seven Fools. Maybe Cinderella was in this story too. So you do like maths? I had a feeling. Well, you know, I don't dislike it. In high school, I liked how there was one concrete answer, no vague components, so math was all I did. I liked clear-cut things, but in college, at the ER3 system, I came to realise that it wasn't necessarily the case. It's just like shogi or chess. You just have to get a checkmate, but there are infinite number of ways to get there. I felt as if I'd been swindled or something. Like when a lover shows an unfamiliar side to themselves to you. She laughed as if to say, a romantic idea, but not exactly. But I was also a little touched, you know. In my high school days, I always figured math wouldn't be any use once I got to the real world. But in fact, there really are cases where you have to use calculus and cubic equations and such. You use fractionals in everyday life. I was definitely touched by that fact. I understand. I nodded. I really did. She smiled in a satisfied way. Are you a math person too? 
On average, men are much more likely to be mathematically inclined than women because of the way that their brains work. Is that so? Well, based on statistical data. Sounds like sexist data to me. Besides, statistical evidence is pretty unreliable. If you roll a die a hundred times and it lands on six every single time, that doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be the six the next time too. I told her this, but she protested. If it lands on six a hundred times in a row, it's a die that only lands on six. It's too significant a difference to be written off as a coincidence or leaning odds. Male, female statistics are kind of like that too. Heh, <laughs> you're so feminist. Or are you just being polite around me? Well, unfortunately, I'm not a feminist. Listening to talk about expanding women's rights and women's liberations make me sick to my stomach. I mean, right? They're obviously spouting nonsense. Sure, it's a man's world, but it's not gender equality we need. It's equal opportunity to apply our abilities. Men and women are so different that you could practically call them genetically separate creatures. So I believe that they have separate roles. Of course, that rests on the major assumption that your role and what you want to do are separate. And the minor assumption that if you have to choose between the two, what you want to do should come first. Ah, and maybe the medium-sized assumption that you can do what you want to do first, but saying you can't do anything sounds like a convenient excuse to me. There's also a factor of the environment. Environment, huh? But there was even an age when women were forbidden from writing, or from sculpting. Regarding recent trends, I've become more inclined to sympathise with men. I feel that they're closer to my own point of view, but also, until the modern day, the workplace was always exclusively male-dominated, right? So it's no wonder they got angry at women and wanted to butt in. They were just righting a wrong. That's just tough luck for men, I wondered. I wondered why I had to take the feminist stance. Hmm, she nodded. Maybe you're right. I don't really know. But I can't understand why women get angry at men too. Even though they're just carrying out roles and we're just carrying out ours. They still act big about it and put on airs. It's no wonder women get angry. Just so long as they don't try and mix me up with anything. I guess what I truly want is for a feminist to just do it away from me. Whatever the case may be, women are inherently boring breed. Just like you, men. Hmm. Come to think of it, there were more men and women in the R3 too. Within the Seven Fools, five were men. Increasing returns, huh? Eh? She seemed taken aback. I'm afraid I don't know that word. What is it? Some kind of dieting thing or something? It means beta loss to VHS. Ah, you mean the bias that occurs in economics. That's right. To return a once male biased world to equilibrium, you have to go through quite a bit of hardship. Really, there wouldn't be any problems if men and women weren't just acting jealous of each other. But nobody gets it, do they? And yet they claim that there's no difference between separation and discrimination. You know, akane -san, coming from you, this all sounds convincing. I guess you must be going through quite a bit of hardship yourself. Never, she said flatly. I just make little effort. It was a loaded statement. Suddenly I had recalled something that I wanted to ask someone ever since I first learned the Seven Fools' existence in the R3. Say, who's the number one smartest person in the entire ER3 system? In other words, who is the smartest person in the world? Akane-san answered with little deliberation. Number two is Fräulein Love. And number one? Come on, kid, you expect me to list everyone? Uh, kidding, kidding. Hmm. To answer your question seriously, the person I respect the most, or in other words, the person I place above myself and all others, is probably Assistant Professor Howlett. He is the number one for sure. Almost unspeakably accomplished. He was the single greatest mind of the last century. And probably this one as well. The first and probably the last man to master every subject when he was still in his single digits. Granted special criminal immunity by the president, he was used his special intellect to serve good of the nation. If Akane-san was like a god to me, Assistant Professor Howlett was the very fabric of the universe. If he had been a woman, he probably would have changed history, she said, looking off into the distance. It was a curious look of admiration. Sorry for the wait. With expert Taiman, Hikari-san appeared, pushing a cart. On top of it sat my breakfast. With experienced hands, she placed it in front of me, followed by the knife and fork on either side. Please take your time, she said with a bow and a radiant smile, and then went off somewhere once more. It seemed as though there were lots of work to do. Nine pieces of deep-fried risotto balls on lettuce, fish soup, salad, and a sandwich made with Italian bread, plus coffee. That Sashirona san is hot stuff, huh? Akane san muttered, eyeing my meal. Sashirona yoyoi. She ran the mansion's kitchen, but she wasn't an employee. 
Indeed, she was one of the geniuses who had been invited to the island. Having already been here for over a year, at this point, she was the longest-running guest. There was no doubt that many of the elite visitors to the island had come in hopes of trying her cuisine. Officially, her specialty was Western cuisine, but she could just as skillfully do any other type, whether it be Chinese, Japanese, or what have you. She was a cooking master with whom no one in the culinary world wasn't familiar. Or so went the tales about her. Personally, I was just as ignorant about cooking as I was about art and academics, so I had sadly never heard of yoyoi san until visiting the island. But having the privilege to try her dishes three times a day, plus between meal snacks, even I came to know her extraordinary culinary prowess. The typical image of a company the first name like Yoyoi is either that of a stuck-up know-it-all or a short, spunky girl, but this Yoyoi-san fit neither of those descriptions, instead turning out to be a boisterous and lively woman with short hair. With a polite manner about her, she was the unarrogant type. Despite being called a genius, she was also probably the only down-to-earth person in the whole island, besides me. Likewise, she was the second most pleasant person to talk to. Incidentally, Ikari-san was the first. Nah, just babbling. Word had it that Yoyoi-san possessed some power that allowed her to make any food better than any other cook. But just what was it? I was curious to know, but I had yet to inquire. She spent most of her day in the kitchen. I think that's what you call a shut-in. So opportunities to speak with her were rare. I noticed that Akane-san was hungrily eyeing my risotto balls. After a moment of my refusing to speak up, she transferred her gaze to me. Something about her eyes was slightly different from before, like those of a carnivore hunting wild game. Have you heard that people originally didn't acknowledge any number past seven? Well, I... Apparently all numbers past seven were simply thought of as a lot. I had also heard in my program training that this was a fundamental reason why the fools were limited to seven people. So yeah, so just looking at things objectively, if your nine risotto balls turned into eight, don't you think that wouldn't be such a great loss? And? You're a sharp guy, huh? A good match for a girl like Kunigisa. It's not like that between us. Don't change the subject. Are you trying to get me to koto with you? Fine. Sashi no sans risotto balls are delicious, so give me one. You happy? I slid my plate to her without saying anything. Akane-san began to gleefully pop down the risotto balls one after another. Before you knew it, they were all gone. Apparently by one, she meant one plate. Well, I was never the one to eat a whole lot in the morning anyway. I was supposed to eat for Kunigisa too, but it was awfully cruel of her to leave that to me. Switching channels, I made my way to the sandwich and salad. Not to be too generic, it was really good. If you said that this was the only kind of food that was served at the island, and all of it free no less, no genius would decline. Surprisingly, even Akane-san was evidently in that boat. Now then, to get back to the subject you're so slyly avoiding, she said, wiping her mouth with a napkin. If it's not like that between you two, just what is your relationship? If you were just friends, you wouldn't have come to this island together. You have school to worry about. Indeed, by coming to the island, I had missed every day of class in the school entrance ceremony. Incidentally, I also missed the entrance ceremony. In other words, well, yeah. I met her before I was in the program, so there's a blank five years. Hmm. And when you get back, she turned into a cyber terrorist, huh? That's a sordid little tale. Indeed. I saw it coming even when we were 13 years old. Nevertheless, reuniting with her after my five years studying abroad, I was honestly surprised at how little it changed from the old days. Anyone would be surprised if they suddenly returned to their early teens. Of course, that was just how things seemed. In reality, she'd become much more of a human in terms of personality. Our relationship. Asked flat out. It was a tough question to answer. Kunigisa needed me. That much I knew. However, I didn't really have to be me. It would be extremely difficult to explain the circumstances that surrounded us. To do so, I'd have to explain a lot about Kunigisa herself. And I didn't especially want to do that. Hmm. Akane-san nodded. I haven't talked with Kunigisa all that much, but it seems to me that she has many shortcomings to go through everyday life. Hmm. I guess I shouldn't say shortcomings. It's not like she's defective, but her focus is just so skewed. It reminds me of a friend of whose kid is a savant. Savant. In French, it means person with wisdom. I was aware that Kunigisa too used to be called a savant. I probably knew that much about her. So she probably really does need someone like you looking after. There's no doubt about that. But I mean, how does that make you feel? I didn't have an answer. It seems like you two have something of a codependent existence, Akane-san continued. Codependent existence? She tilted her head as if to say, haven't you heard the word? It's a symptom of addiction that affects human relationships. Like for example, 
let's say that there's a recovering alcoholic who has a caretaker by his side. He needs the caretaker, and the caretaker devotedly looks after him. But when the devotion goes to extremes, it's a sign of codependency. They get drunk on serving. You could say that they're a mild case of romantic couples. Needless to say, it's not a good thing. You end up putting each other at waste. I'm not going to say that you two are like that, but you might want to take care. Sure, few things are as meaningless as prolonging a failed relationship, but still, I'm full of nothing but awe for Kunigisa Chan's talents. Even the ER3, they're using software to create, uh, they created rather, but certainly, but certainly I never imagined I would meet her in a place like this. Why were you on the island anyway? It wasn't like the Seven Fools had the emptiest schedules in the world. No real reason, she said after a few moments of silence. It was a strangely blunt response, and it bothered me a little. But more importantly, even if you're not the best player, you at least know the rules of Shogi and Chess, right? Why don't we have a game while we reminisce a little more about ER3? Sure, a Shogi challenge with one of the Seven Fools. Sounded interesting. But not without looking. My memory is famously bad. Not the greatest reputation to have, if I do say so myself. If we change locations, I'm in. I've got a board in my room. It was the first thing I bought when I got back to Japan. Hmm. I've actually got some work to do in this morning. How's this afternoon? Sounds good. Ah, oh, wait. I can't. I've already got something. Oh? A meeting with Kunagisa-chan or something? Hmm? Well, if that's the case, what can you do? No, with Kanami-san. Boom. Akane's expression grew unusually stern. Damn it. I'd forgotten. Hikari-san had been kind enough to let me know that Akane-san and Kanami-san were on catastrophically bad terms. But because of my famously bad memory, I had forgotten. Hmm. We're pals, so I'll give you a bit of advice. You shouldn't hang around with someone with such a vulgar occupation. Lowering oneself like you is stupid, you know? Akane-san, you really hate Kanami-san, don't you? No. There's no reason for me to embrace any feelings of like or dislike towards that woman. But an artist is a truly despicable race. <sighs> Seriously. She banged her hand on the table. There's nothing I hate more than painters. They're the most inferior race in existence. Compared to them, thieves, anti-rapists look like Jesus. All they do is dab a little paint on something with a little brush, and they think that they're so damn great. A little red, a little blue, and poof, it's a masterpiece. <sighs> Anybody can do that. It was as if she'd turned into another person. It was such an abrupt transformation. It almost made you wonder if the painter had once stolen her research materials or something. Oh, sorry, she said, returning to her normal self once upon noticing my stunned expression. I guess I got carried away. Not that I'm going to take any of that back, but I know it's not fun to listen to someone gripe about someone else. I think I'm going to go cool off, she said, her words racing, then helped herself to the rest of my coffee and made for the door. It seems she was getting losing her head like that even if she wasn't going to take it back. Once I was alone, I let out a sigh. Man, I had been nervous. I'm not that used to holding conversations with people in the first place, much less Sonoyama Akane of the ER3 Seven Fools. No sweat, right? Well, aside from the blunder at the very end, we were actually able to hold much more natural conversation than I would have imagined. So I guess I should have been happy. Or maybe sometime in the next four days, I would go and have a game of shogi with her. I let out another sigh. But there was no time to snooze. Having finished breakfast, I decided to pay yet another visit to Kunagisa's room. But not a second later, Maki-san appeared in a mid-yawn, fully dressed in an outgear attire, which she complimented with a high ponytail. She looked very much like she'd come to the island on a vacation. Ba -da -da -ba 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 -ba. She hummed cheerfully as she strolled over and took a seat by me. Good morning. Hello. No, no, no. You gotta say good morning when you greet someone in the morning. Ah, uh, wait. Is it not still morning? I've been up since six, so it probably feels pretty late to you. Wow, as for me, I have extraordinarily low blood pressure, so I can't be like you, she said with another big yawn. I gave the usual nod and yup convo. There was no point in asking how she knew when I woke up. I was once again nervous, this time for an entirely different way than when I was with Akane-san. Himena Maki-san. Of course, she wasn't just here for the surfing. There was a solid reason for her being on the island. Maki-san's occupation was fortune-telling. Just as Kanami-san was a painting genius and Akane-san an academic genius, Maki-san was known as a genius of the world of fortune-telling. Now that's a real talent, huh? I thought to myself. That aside, I wasn't a big fan of Maki-san. We had a bad first impression of each other. You're a fortune-teller. I've never met one of those before. 
So how does my fortune look? It's not like I actually cared all that much about my fortune. I just figured that since she was a fortune teller, it'd be a socially appropriate thing to say. Normally, any person would be thrilled to have their conversation turned into their field of expertise. As Churchill once said, I want to talk about what I know, but people only ask me about what I don't. I just didn't want to be one of those people. That's just an excuse, though. But after hearing my question, Maki-san sneered and said, Well, give me your year, month, date of birth, your blood type, your name, and your favourite movie actor. I answered, but all the while wondering what possible connection my favourite actor could have to my fortune, birthday, and blood type aside. In any case, I had forgotten my blood type. I didn't really know a lot of movie actors for that matter. So I just made some answers up. Okay, I see. Then take this, Maggie-san said, producing a slip of paper in her pocket and handing it to me. And that's when she left. I opened the paper fortune, took a look. My date of birth, along with my blood type and actor I had just given, were inscribed on it in miniature font. You were tricking me, weren't you? After that, I went and checked Kunagis for about it. I figured it was some worn-out magic trick where the pocket has hidden slips of paper with random numbers written on them or something, I said. Hmm, hmm, Kunagisa shook her head. No way, that might work if you played cards, but for something like this there would have to be too many. Plus, she would have had to look you up beforehand. It's not like she could have guessed that you would lie about your blood type and favourite actor. Then Kunagisa gave me the Hima no Maki lecture. It seemed as though uneducated fools like myself hadn't heard of her. Maki-san had actually made quite a name for herself in the fortune-telling world. She didn't do those supposedly therapeutic horoscope-style cold readings that you see in magazines, but rather used her skills to advise bigwig politicians and corporate clients, never to make much of a spectacle of herself. Himane Maki, master fortune-teller, also known as a good self-promoter, I commented. Kunagisa seemed to think of her that way too. Her catchphrase for her, the telepath who knows the past, the future, human beings, the world, and all inside it. What's a telepath? She's super-powered, she said aloofly. She's got extensory perception. Huh? ESP. Super abilities are divided into two categories. ESP and PK. What Mackie Chan's got is ESP. Retrocognition. Procognition. And, te and telepathy. In translation, retrocognition means that she can see the past. Procognition means that she knows the future. Telepathy means that she can read your psyche. Wait a sec. I don't follow. Slow down, Tomo. Maki-san is a fortune teller, right? Occupationally, yes, using her special abilities. That's all. Being able to run fast isn't an occupation, right? But being an athlete is. Being good with your hands isn't an occupation, right? But being a craftsman is. Special abilities are just abilities, but fortune telling is an occupation. Ah, I nodded. So Maki-san, yep, she read your thoughts in advance, even before you asked those questions. She flashed a bright smile. Superpowers, huh? I muttered softly so not to be heard by Maki-san, now sitting next to me in the dining room. I recalled my conversation with Kunigisa. Her previous explanation had sounded somewhat convincing, to be sure. But, now sitting next to the sleepy-eyed, spacey woman, it was really hard to imagine she was a fortune teller. She just seemed like some drowsy chick with low blood pressure. I told you I'm a fortune teller, but you seem dissatisfied, she said, suddenly shifting her glance towards me. For some reason, she seemed to pick on me a little ever since our first encounter. Perhaps you'd like me to go walking around a black hood in a crystal ball. Should I speak with you in vague, cryptic terms about your impending doom? You just take everything at face value, don't you? I don't think that's the case. Yeah, I'll bet. I know all about it, she replied, shaking her head. Well, whatever. You don't matter anyway. I don't matter? Yep, you're a Japanese representative of things that don't matter. In other words, the most unimportant guy in Japan. It was a terrible thing to hear. I'll give you one piece of advice out of the kindness of my heart. Your, your impression of me is quite out of line. And that's not all. The ideas you hold about the residents of this island are all out of line. That includes Kunigisa-chan. More important, it looks like you intentionally adjust your belief when you're talking to other people. That's surely, very com that's surely a very comfortable way to live. But I wouldn't call it a wise one. She rattled off at me as she let out another cat-like yawn. For those two days... I had gotten the same earful gripes every time we met, and I couldn't say that she was all far off the mark either. Her remarks were so accurate, I wondered if she really was using telepathy. I'll be honest, I found her creepy. Oh, sorry for being creepy. With that said, she stormed off in the direction of the kitchen, presumably to get her breakfast. So as to not let this opportunity slip through my fingers, I immediately made my way out of the dining room and back to Kunigisa's room. As I expected, 
She was still face to face with her workstation. It didn't seem right to be such a shut-in while also being a guest in another person's home. But I guess we had different values. Kunagisa looked back at me. Oh, Ichan, welcome back. How was it? Did you run into anyone? Almost everyone. Today I've seen everyone except Teriko-san and Iria-san. Oh, and Yuyoi-san too. But I have eaten her food. I felt as if I had met her. Hmm. Well, that's almost perfect. What is? Your score in the meeting everyone in Wet Crow's Feather Island by mid-morning contest. What a crappy sounding contest. But anyway, there were currently 12 people on the island. Artist, Ibuki Kanami-san. Chef, Sashirono Yoyoi-san. Sonoyama Akane-san from the Seven Fools. Fortune teller, Himane Maki-san. And engineer, Kunigi Satomo. Then there were Sakaki Shinya and myself, the Tagalongs. Then there are the original residents of the island, starting with Akagami Iria, who owned the island and the mansion, plus the head maid, Handa Rie-san, and the three all-purpose maids, Chiga Akari-san, Chiga Hikari-san, and Chiga Teriko-san. A total of 12 people. In an ordinary-sized house, things would have already gone quite cramped, but in this oversized place, there was still excess space. That's when I remembered, Hey Kunigisa, how long are you planning to be here again? Another four days, so for a week, yeah? Shinya-san was asking me about something. I explained to her. What Shinya-san? I explained to her what Shinya-san had talked to me about. The rumor about Iria-san's favorite, Jack of all trades, coming to the town. Kunigisa, however, seemed uninterested, tuning out the majority of my story. Is that really important? It's all really vague information, so it's hard to say, but, but I don't really think we need to meet this person. I didn't really come here to meet any geniuses. I'm not really that interested. Well, yeah, but hey, speaking of that, I've been meaning to ask for a while. Why exactly did you come here? If you're not interested in that kind of thing, what were you so interested in? I couldn't figure out why someone who hated leaving their house as much as Kunigisa did would accept an invitation like this. She tilted her head a bit, and after a moment's pause said, Eh, just cuz. A non-answer. There's no particular reason, really. Or are you the type of guy who always needs there to be one for everything? I shrugged. No way. As long as there's a network, it doesn't really matter where I am. Home is the best in the end, though, she said, in spite of still being on vacation. Well, whatever. She was just being her usual whimsical self. I didn't particularly mind, and it wasn't like I was supposed to, either. I sprawled myself out on the pure white carpet and stared up at the chandelier on the ceiling. Man, one unrealistic scene. Then again, if you asked me what would be realistic scene, I wouldn't know what to say. Kunigisa looked at me, sprawling on the floor. Ichan, I don't suppose you're bored? I'm bored with life. You know, that's really unattractive. Huh? She laid right out in front of me. If you're free, why not read a book? I brought a few. A book, huh? What you got? Hmm, a Japanese-English dictionary, the statue books, and a modern Japanese dictionary. Man, bring stuff in digital form. Who has fun reading that kind of stuff? Oh, right, she does. Half giving up and half fed up, I rolled over. Uh, Ichan, your watch is broken, isn't it? Eh? I took a look at my watch. That's right, come to think of it, I had meant to ask her to fix it. After running into so many people this morning, I'd forgotten all about it. Let me see, I'll fix it for you. Here, maybe the battery's dead. Hmm. She held out the watch up to her light. Nope, something else is wrong. Did you bump into something hard? Anyway, I think it'll be a quick fix. But you know, wristwatches have become sort of an anachronism these days. Most people just get by with their cell phones. And speaking of which, where's yours? I left it at home. You should bring it. That must make it a mobile phone. But what if I drop it? Well, I guess, but... It, and it would be out of service here anyway. I would take a phone like yours that can get signal anywhere. Kunigisa uses a phone that receives signals from relay satellites anywhere in the world, even on a deserted island in the middle of nowhere. Her phone didn't know the meaning of the phrase, out of service. It was a terrible waste of money for an anti-socialite like Kunigisa, but she wasn't the type to give much thought to such matters. Hmm, maybe so. Well, it's not like being anachronism is a bad thing. She narrowed her eyes and placed the watch next to the computer rack. Just then, there was a knock at the door. Kunigisa showed no response whatsoever, and I had no choice but to open it myself. The visitor was none other than Hikari-san, cleaning supplies in tow. Hello. Hello. Thanks so much. I invited her in. Yo, Hikari-chan. Ciao. Kunigisa welcomed her with full face grin. Hikari-san responded in a likewise fashion. For some reason, these two girls were strangely friendly with each other. They just plain got along. 
It's a rare thing for someone to be able to become so friendly with Kunigisa in such a short period of time, so I couldn't help but be a little surprised. What are you up to, Tomo-san? I'm making some game software right now. I'm creating an application that converts text to music. I figured I'd give it to Iria-san as a memento of my visit. What kind of game is that? I said. Well, shall I explain? Okay, mm, okay, so, Ichan, what's the longest book you've ever read? I quit halfway through the tale of Genji. I quit halfway through the tale of Genji and Don Quixote. So, Tolstoy's War and Peace? Man, that was long. Okay, so let's say you convert that whole book into a text document, whether by using a scanner or typing it all by hand. Then, and you do a digital to analog conversion, like where E is Do, Ro is Re, Ha is Me, and so on. And if you do that, you end up with War and Peace song. For that much text, it would probably come out around an hour, maybe? Of course, in reality, it's much more complicated than that. The code conversions and sessions and everything have to be wholly consistent. But still, it turns books into music. Sounds fun, right? Well, it definitely sounds interesting, anyway. What programming language are you using? VB? C? Machine language. An extremely basic level coding language. I didn't think anybody uses that kind of language these days. Man, it's like you can communicate with a machine like it's just some close buddy of yours. <laughs> she laughed. She laughed. Just a little boastfully. Seemingly even more ignorant than I am about computers, hikari san wore an inscrutable expression. Not revealing whether she was following the conversation, and said nothing more than, Wow. Seriously, I said. But what's actually fun about this game? I guess I don't really get it. Making it is fun. It was a solid reason. I couldn't object. Hikari-san listened with apparent interest, but then seemed to remember something. Oh, right, she turned to me. Would it be alright if I cleaned your room later on? I stopped by the storeroom a little earlier, but you weren't in. Sure, no problem. I sure didn't know what cleaning there was to be done in that room, though. Hikari-san politely thanked me and resumed cleaning Kunigisa's room. After a single sweep of the room, she stopped and crouched on the floor with a sigh. I apologise, I'm just a little exhausted. Why not take a break? No, I'll be fine. Ray-san would get mad anyway. I've said it before, but she's so strict. I'll be fine. I'm peppy. That's my one positive trait. I'm fine. Please forgive me for causing you concern, she said firmly, and then exited the room. I let out a sigh. Sure seems to have it tough. Maybe it's just my assumption, but seeing her like that, it seems that she's bearing an awfully big load on her own. Do you not feel a little like you're watching yourself? It's not like that, but you know... I do feel a bit of sympathy for her. She did seem to be miserable after all. Reisan and Akarisan seemed to have distinct division in their heads that this was just work, but Akarisan didn't seem to be able to mentally process it in that way. It was like the concept of work hadn't figured into her internal circuit. Perhaps there were circumstances surrounding that. As for the other maid, Teriko-san, I wasn't sure what she was thinking, so I couldn't comment. Everybody's suffering through something, Ichan, Kunigisa said knowingly. Everybody knows hardships, or even if they don't, they're at least exerting effort, somewhere. Hikari-san, your pal Nyo-kun, Akane-chan, everyone. If there's anyone who lives without suffering or exerting effort, it's probably me. After having lunch, I headed to the altar layer as promised. Kunigisa claimed, as usual, not to be hungry and headed to bed shortly after noon. She was a chronically sleep-deprived little techie. Wake me for Din Din, please. I have to see Iria chan and stuff, she said. I knocked on the altar layer door, waiting for a response, then turned the knob. The floors were uncarpeted hardwood. In some ways, it reminded me of the art room in my elementary school, except, of course, that this room wasn't lined with scarred up desks, and there weren't any fake looking plaster sculptures. It wasn't as big either. The total area of the altar layer was probably about half the size of the room of Kunigisa's was. Welcome. Take a seat over there. Kanami-san said after briefly staring at me in a cold silence. Shinya-san must have been in his room or someplace, as Kanami-san was the only person there. I walked past the shelf containing the paint and the paint supplies and took the seat as told. I faced Kanami-san. Thanks for doing this. I couldn't deny that she was a pretty woman. With blonde hair and blue eyes, she was like one of those well-bred young lady. She was like one of those well-bred young ladies that you see in old films. An intellectual at that. And even more, she had an artistic talent. It was like she had God's favour. No, maybe I can't say that. She had bad legs. I guess it would be pretty damn low of me 
in all my able-bodied good fortune to gripe. But on the other hand, Kanami-san herself didn't seem to view her condition as a handicap or disability. God is fair if you're able-bodied. It would have conversely been unfair to ordinary people. Legs are just a decoration. Even when I gained my eyesight, my world hadn't really changed. The world looked just as I thought. Natural selection and fate have usually bad tastes. All of those were quotes from Kanami-san's art books. Kanami-san sat in a round, wooden chair just like the one I was sitting in. She was in a dress, so it looked mildly uncomfortable, I noticed. Kanami-san, is that what you wear when you're painting? Are you doubting my fashion sense? Her face grew subtly more stern. It seemed that it was no joke. She was actually miffed. I scrambled to weasel my way out. No, no, I didn't mean that. I was just thinking your clothes might get dirty. I don't go and change my clothes every time I paint something. Up to now, I've never dirtied my clothes even once while painting. I'm not an idiot. Oh, I see. I guess it was like being an expert calligrapher. In retrospect, getting paint on your clothes is probably a pretty amateur blunder. To Kanami-san, one of the top artists in the entire world, the mere suggestion was probably rude. I shrugged. But is it really okay to paint someone like me? What's that supposed to mean? She snapped with the same stern expression. She seemed to be on pretty awful mood. Or no, maybe this was her default setting. Uh, no, it's just that, wouldn't it decrease your worth as an artist? Like, for example, it was probably safe to say that Kunigisa had technological skill like no one else in the world. However, she only used that technology for fun, so the number of people who actually acknowledged her amazing and brilliant was extremely small. Authority comes from results. Not doing and not being able to do are the same thing. Apparently that was Kunigisa's case. I figured it was the same with painters. If you're able to choose your subjects randomly and mess around all the time, It'd be hard to get other people to acknowledge your worth as an artist. But Kanami-san resounds my ideas. Didn't I just tell you that I'm not an idiot? Do you have a brain at all? I don't go around choosing subjects. You know, if you keep your mouth shut, people won't see how stupid you are. So why don't you just do that? My heart sank. I just... I... I just hate that kind of thinking. It makes me want to puke. Oh, there were no good subjects to paint. My model was no good. The environment was all wrong. That's not the kind of subject that I should be painting. And it's not just with painters either. Even you know people who say obnoxiously egotistical things. Like, oh, this isn't what I want to do. Or, oh, I don't know what to do, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, myself. For God's sake, she sighed. I hate people who bitch about what they want and don't want to do. Putting their own ineptitude on a pedestal. I want to tell them to stop living like pricks. I don't mean that they should all die. But they should be more humble. Just paint anything and stop whining all the time. I don't care if it's some boring jerk or a pile of bug guts. I'd turn it into gorgeous art. Regardless of how sweet and pretty she looked. She sure was full of herself. She was so uncompromising. That she didn't even forgive others who compromised. Being compared to a pile of bug guts wasn't my favourite thing in the world. But if she could paint that. Surely she could paint me. It seemed that making any further thoughtful comments would just end badly, so I decided to stay quiet. I noticed that behind Kanami-san was a canvas. An under-angled view of a cherry blossom tree was drawn in a pencil. The one she had been looking at this morning with Shinya-san. It was precisely drawn. It was like a monochrome photograph with about 10 million pixels. No, that's dumb. There was no need to cheapen such an intricate drawing with that kind of metaphor. I pointed to the picture. When did you draw that? This morning. Got a problem? It was early in the morning when she was observing the tree. That was about five hours earlier. In other words, she had drawn this amazingly detailed picture in a mere five hours. A drawing like that should have taken at least a week to complete. Without thinking, I shot her a sceptical expression. She grimaced back at me, audaciously. Only idiots spend three or four months doing something that you can finish in a week. Idiots or lazy people. And since I'm neither, I did this picture in three hours. It doesn't take me longer than that. Huh? Being the pure embodiment of laziness myself, this was painful to hear. It stung. I wish Kunagisa could have heard of it too. Right. Even you have to agree a little too, right? She said with a cruel tone, demanding my concurrence. I couldn't help but feel that she was attacking me with a direct insult. I had doubt that that was just a false impression. Uh, no, well, I mean, yeah, uh, but anyway, you're really good. Yeah, sure. She answered, completely uninterested in my generic phrase. It really was an exceedingly bland compliment for me to make. In retrospect, you're really good. It sounds like something a five-year-old would say. Uh, so, Kanami-san, 
You do detail pictures? I do all kinds of pictures. Don't you know? Oh yeah. I put my toot in my mouth again. The woman before my eyes was Ibuki Kanami-san. The woman artist who had denied having a single style and took no stance, whether it be detailed or abstract. There was no picture that she couldn't or wouldn't paint. She squinted just one eye at me. I don't get hung up on one style. It's not a rule set in stone, but getting too hung up is just plain crazy. It's nuts. If there's one thing in life I want to do as I please, it's painting. You may be right, huh? Unable to argue or concur, I sailed a simple nod. Perhaps able to see through me, she returned my nod with a contemptuous sneer. Hey, have you ever seen my art? Well, a few times in some of your art books, but owing my ignorance, this is the first time I've ever seen it directly. Hmm, what do you think of it? Not the art book stuff, but the cherry blossom one. To me, Kanami-san's question was a bit of a surprise. I never figured out a so-called genius cared much about other people's opinions of them. Starting with Sonoyama Akane-san, none of the people in ER3, including the deplorable group of study abroad participants, had any variety of desire for glory, and nobody cared about how they looked in other people's eyes. I know my worth better than anyone else does. I don't need to sit there and be evaluated by a bunch of brainless slackers. That was their unanimous way of thinking. Probably why I wasn't a big fan of theirs. Hmm, I said, groping for an answer. Well, it's a very pretty picture. A pretty picture, huh? She repeated my line. You know, there's no need to try and flatter me. I won't get mad. Well, it's just that I don't really have much of a judgement or a critical eye for this kind of thing. But yeah, I think it's a pretty picture. Hmm, pretty. She wore an utterly disappointed expression. As she stared at her canvas, she muttered something to herself. Pretty. 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 That's not the kind of compliment you give art. Eh? Hmm? You don't get it, huh? Damn. I really don't want to do this. What a waste. She let a heavy sigh, hunched over a bit, picked up the canvas. She lifted it up over her head and smashed it on the hardwood floor. The sound of splintered wood. Of course. Of course. It wasn't the floor that had broken. Hey, what are you doing? As you can see, I'm disposing of my screw-up. <sighs> Why did I have to come to this? That decidedly should have been my line. She stared down at the shattered remains of her canvas, a sorrowful expression on her face, and let out another sigh. Jeez, it looked like it would have been worth 20 million one day. 20 million yen? 20 million dollars. Different unit. Of course, we're talking about several decades later. Artists can be pretty reckless sometimes, huh? I couldn't help but feel guilty that my crappy comments had invited this disaster. You shouldn't feel like you did something wrong. This is my responsibility. I'm not the kind of imbecile who pushes their own responsibilities onto other people. But I'm just an amateur. You didn't have to do something that based on opinion of an amateur. It's not art if you get to pick who looks at it, she insisted. So that's how it was. I could understand that. Her words and her manner were filled to the brim with spitefulness. But to be sure... This woman was an artist to the bone. But it was so realistic. It was like a photograph. That's not a compliment either. You know. Listen, if you have a habit of complimenting people by saying, it's just like blah blah blah, I would think you'd better quit it. It's really an insult in the highest order. If you absolutely have to box everything into a style. Though, I guess there's no hope. She turned back towards me. I suppose I can understand why you say it was like a photograph. Though, after all, Photographs originally spawned from drawings. Is that right? Yeah. You didn't know? She raised an eyebrow to me. It seemed saying, you didn't know, was her habit. Yeah, you didn't know? She raised her ha- Yeah? Yeah, you didn't know? She raised an eyebrow at me. It seemed that saying, you didn't know, was her habit. The person who invented daguerreotype photography was a factual artist. Apparently, the study of perspective is reality to the invention of the camera. You've heard of the camera obscura, right? Heard of it, yes. The so-called dark chamber. The phenomenon where if you make a hole in one spot on the wall of a pitch black room, the outside scenery will project onto the opposite wall. It was quite an old technology, dating back to the days of the Roman Empire, and even having mentioned by Aristotle. Supposedly, it was the origin of the camera. It was just one invention used to create accurate images. The main idea behind perspective is to show things how they really look. That was how the French Arthur Corbett put it. He also made such realistic remarks as, I've never seen an angel, so why would I paint one? It goes against my philosophy though. If you get a kid to draw something, it never has perspective or depth, right? 
everything just displayed in the foreground. The size of objects is also chosen at a whim. So for example, a house and a person are the same size, or the most important thing is drawn the biggest. In other words, what they're putting on the canvas isn't what objects look like, it's just how the objects feel. If you believe that drawings and pictures are a form of personal expression, then I think that's the correct way to do it. If you think about it like that, a drawing that looks just like a photograph isn't a good drawing at all, is it? Wow. As soon as she had broken out the professional lingo, I lost my grip on what she was talking about, and with all her chit chat, she hadn't even started setting up to paint. When was she planning to get started already? Though truth be told, photographs aren't such an accurate representation of reality either. You can edit a photograph well. It's not hard to fool people. Maybe they're not so different from paintings, in the sense that they're both selective. Uh, Kanami san were you going to draw me? Right now, I'm memorising. Just as I thought I was being cold and competent again, she spoke to me with an unexpected gentleness. Maybe you didn't know, I'm the type who has to do her work alone. When I'm with other people, my focus goes wacko. She sounded like Leonardo da Vinci. Artists who don't look and paint at the same time weren't the kind of thing you heard about every day, but they weren't the most uncommon things in the world either, so I wasn't particularly surprised. So when I do portraits, I just have to rely on memory. You can do that? To me, memory and perception are synonyms. Now she sounded like Hannibal the Cannibal. Let's just stay and talk like this for the next two hours. Then I'll start painting after you leave. Ah, after I redo this cherry blossom picture that is. I want to turn it into something that at least you can comprehend. For your painting, I'll need to put down two layers of colour, so it'll be a little while to draw. I should be able to give it to you tomorrow morning. You'll give it to me? Sure, I don't need that kind of painting. I have no interesting paintings that are finished. I'll sign it, so if you sell it, you should be able to make something decent. Of course, you could always destroy it if you don't like it, but that seems a bit of a waste. It should be worth about 50 million. What a materialistic conversation. <sighs> hey, by the way, I hear that you're on bad terms with akane -san, right? That's right. Or well, really, it's sort of a one side of hatred on her part. As an individual, as a scholar, as a researcher, as a member of the ER374, I personally have nothing but goodwill and respect for Sonoyama Akane. But, but, what's that supposed to mean? She gave a little smirk. As for just plain Sonoyama Akane, I despise her. Two hours later, after leaving Kaname-san's atelier, I headed for Kunagisa's room. She was in bed, but evidently, she had awoken at some point and fixed my watch. In a world-class prank, she had changed the digital face and numbers were displayed backward, but at least it seemed to be working, so I stuck it on my left arm, patted the sleeping Kunagisa on the head, said thanks, and headed to Akane's room. Play me, she challenged, and then said with a delighted smile, I'll give myself a bigger handicap. With that, she lined her side of shogi board with chess pieces. It's a Japanese western compromise. Kind of like two different martial arts styles, huh? Handicap notwithstanding, I was thoroughly trounced seven times in a row.